Everyone in the street questions with Kale Burke. Look at this, man. Music. All right, I'm actually here today with Kale Burke. Kale, actually, I have known you basically from day I before Twitter was invented, I felt like, right? <laughs> It's been a while. Like I've known you, right? When See, was Twitter invented? Was that me? 18... Oh, sorry. Just checking. Just checking. Yeah. 2006. But it's like, been a long time. Basically, right when I got on, we connected. Yep. You actually brought me out to your school district. I did. Um, when I don't, no one brought me out to the school district. Like you were probably the first person to ever bring me to a speaking engagement. I think so, we were. I I don't think. <laughs> I'm like 99% sure you were the first place that I actually had to get on a plane to go to, to speak. So well, uh, I remember man, those days. It was, uh, it was a, a long flight for you, maybe an hour into a tiny <laughs> little regional airport. Yeah. But you know what? It was, uh, it was a great day. You rocked the nation with, uh, with our yeah. crew that day. And, it was, uh, and hopefully it was a good launch point. Because yeah, uh, so, look so, at how it's all worked out. It, yeah, and it's, been, it's been good. And Kale, I, I've, uh, c- I've connected with Kale um, for, for many, many years. He is a, a brilliant mind, way smarter than me. So whatever, whatever I say in the podcast today is going to be 10 <laughs> times smarter than what Kale shares. About I want 10. my wife to hear this. Uh, I'm smarter than someone. This is good. Hey, can you? <laughs> this is good. I didn't say you're smarter than her, but you're smarter yeah, than me, right? <laughs> So, hey, so we're going to do three questions with Kale first, but Kale does actually have a, a, a new book out. It's called Navigating Leadership Drift, Ob- Observable Impact on Rigorous Learning. He wrote that with Michael McDowell, who we were talking about this before. Michael McDowell is in Marin County, and uh, Marin County is actually where I was when my dad passed away. So, like, when I saw that, like, my, I don't know if my, you know, I, I don't know if my heart dropped. I always, like, I actually weirdly look at that place with some fondness because of the people there that took care yeah. of me on such a day. So like, it's, it's kind of a weird feeling, but you know, how, how serendipitous is that? But before we get into your questions, uh, can you just tell us a little bit and I I'm reading the, the byline here and I feel this is a book that's really, really needed in education right now, like more than ever. So if you can just give us like the one minute, what is this book about? I think that's a great place to start. You know, maybe the easiest way to talk about the book is just the first line. And the first line is, is that we're losing leaders in education. And I think that's what the book is about, is, is really having people start to get a sense of, of the stresses and strains that have been put on leaders, especially in the post-COVID era. So the book really talks about how, you know, in truth, we have a lot of opportunity as leaders to be able to change the way we approach our day, our week, our month. But sometimes we drift and we sometimes we tend to drift too far into the problem and trying to understand the problem. Sometimes we drift too far into the solution and trying to do all the work. And what the book really does, I think, is gives practical solutions for leaders to lead from the middle, to right. be able to avoid the leadership drifts so that we aren't burning out at the rate that we're we're doing right now and and i just hope that when people read the book it really resonates with them because it's not only got some real technical things for people to consider some tools but it's also fun as well and i think it's it's important for us as administrators that are out there to be able to have a little bit of a smile on our faces every once in a while so hopefully drift is one of those books that can uh, can not only make us smile a little bit but it resonates and also gives us some practical solutions as well yeah, so make sure you check it out. Uh, it's actually in the description down below. And one, I, I'm curious because I know you and I are both huge sports fans. You had to wear that Boston Red Sox. I see that. What's going? <laughs> I know you're a big Red Sox fan. Um, I, I actually, so you, I don't know if you know this. Have I ever sh- shared this with you? So you taught, or, or he was in your school, Kelly uh, Olinick, correct? That is so correct. I actually, I actually ref Kelly Olinick. Did you know that? I think I did know this. He yeah. came to a tournament in Alberta, did he not? He did. I repped him. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. And uh, I remember that someone in the crowd was yelling, they're like, Do you know who my son is? And I'm like, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care. And he's in the NBA now. But one of he the. Is. Yeah. Because I, I remember he's in foul trouble, the game that I, I, I repped, right? And, you know, his, his dad would probably blame me. So, it, you know, it's kind of cool to see him growing up. And one of the things that I, I've always said, about leadership, there's it's kind of interesting because I compare it to refing that if you notice a ref in a game, you're probably not doing a really great job. It's kind of the refs that you don't really notice because all the things are kind of just working and stuff like that. That's actually the really great refs. And there's a lot of you know connection to leadership. 
that it's really how you put your people in really good positions to be successful. Yep. And sometimes, you know, our egos kind of get in the way and we want the credit when we're in those admin positions, but really the credit is in how well your teachers do, how well your school does. And it is, you know, it's a tough job, but I, you know, I know that Kale's got a ton of wisdom on this and, um, you know, learning more about uh, Michael McDowell and his work too. So uh, definitely check out the book. It, as I said, in the description down below, but Kale, you've been teaching for a while, teaching longer than me. I found that out, even though, you know, I thought you were younger than me and I found that out you're, you're a couple years older. So I'm like a little bit excited about that. Well, it's a good thing that you're 29, George, and I'm 31. <laughs> right. Right. So <laughs> Um, you've been in education for a while, and I'm sure you've, you, I know you've worked with amazing teachers. Um, I'm sure you had some as a kid, but when you think of a teacher that really inspired you, who's someone that comes to your mind and why? Well, you know, I guess it's going to sound a little bit sporty as well, but uh, I had a, a PE teacher uh, in high school who was also my volleyball coach, and uh, his name was Dale Pop. Uh, and I think the thing that really resonated with, with me about Dale wasn't, it wasn't about, you know, sort of content knowledge or, mm -hmm. or his ability to teach us how to do a layup. It was actually more about how he treated us and he, he treated me as a, as a human being. And I remember he treated me as a young man, not a child. And I had a volleyball tournament where where um, I was the the last play. I hit a ball out of bounds. We lost the game. And I just remember that he grabbed me right after the game and just mm. kind of gave me this big hug and, and, and made it all right. And so I don't forget stuff like that because he was not only a great person, but I think like like leaders, like teachers, he he took that moment to realize I, I can have a real impact on this kid right now. I could blast him for firing that ball out of bounds, mm. or I could understand how he's probably feeling right now and really grab on to him. And that's something I think that I'll never forget. We still mm. I saw him in an airport serendipitously a couple of years ago, and it was like things had uh, had never changed. So I think that was the teacher that really uh, that really sat with me. I love that story. Give him Dale a little. <laughs> Oh, shout out for it right there. So, you know, so it, you, I, I'm going to share your age. You told me you're 52. I, so I, I, sports I, never leaves you. Okay? <laughs> I still swear, like it's there's games we lost, games we won that I can't. It's yep. it sticks with you forever, right? And yep. um, when it, this is like, uh, you know, when you're talking about Dale, did Dale work in Kamloops with you or no? No, he worked in Kelowna. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Cause like I, I, for some reason, I, I kind of remember you telling me this, something yep. about this before hearing the story before I remember in probably my first or second year of teaching, I was the high school basketball coach and the, the, there was another coach there and she, she was in there and I'm like giving her a hard time and joking around with her. And then one of my players was there and I'm doing the exact same thing. He's like, you treat everyone the same. I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, if I know you, I'm going to razz you. I'm going to give you a little bit of a hard time. And, and it was like, he, he said it kind of, you know, as like, you don't treat us, you know, like little kids that we don't know anything. It was a compliment at the time. Right. Cause he saw like, I had the same respect for my students that I had for the, the other teachers too. And I, and that was like, I, I appreciated that he said that, that he noticed that because it was like, yeah, if I know you, you're, 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 I'm going to give you a little bit of hard time. I'm going to joke around with you and that. So that when you told that story about Dale, I really connected with me. Now, I met many of your, um, the administrators you've worked with in the past. I know we've uh, kind of traveled in circles where we've met some really incredible um, educational leaders. And we know like if you're a principal, you're not necessarily a leader. And when I talk about leaders, um, you know, that could be teachers in the classroom for sure. But when you think of an administrator specifically, who's someone that you've worked with, maybe had when you were a student that really kind of inspired you and why? So it's interesting because the, the first place that I worked um, set the bar for me. And I, I worked in a small town called Osuias, British Columbia. It's a desert in the middle of, uh, of BC, which sounds weird for anyone outside mm -hmm. of, of Canada to know that there's a place in Canada that's actually a desert. But the principal there in my first teaching job was a guy named Marty Lewis. And, and I think Marty, um, first of all, and then, gosh, I keep coming back to sports. He was a huge sports fan. Unfortunately, he, he liked Duke, which that didn't sit very well with me <laughs> at the time. But, but he, uh, great basketball coach, but he really applied a lot of those coaching principles 
to being a principal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his, his idea was, was really this idea about how can we collaborate together and, and kind of that, that concept of, of definitely incomplete, possibly incorrect, but I know as a group, we can make it better. And I think, you know, Marty, uh, not only was a, a true leader, because there were times when he had to make the tough call and the tough decision. Mm -hmm. But there was lots of times when we got to be a part of his thinking and the thinking of the school. And, and I, I think that really helped me as a teacher to shape and, and in the future as a leader to shape this idea that we do have some good ideas. But you know what, as a larger group, um, I think we can make those ideas better. So Marty was a, a guy to this day that I, I still keep in contact with but I think he almost more than any person has influenced my trajectory as a leader and so I, I want to give him a real shout out today because he was uh, just one of the very best shout hey. out shout Gosh, out to I gotta get one of those horns when I get that. <laughs> everyone knows the podcast hates it but uh, it's still, so <laughs> it, it is it is one of my favorite things you know um when you're telling the story because that that was you said it you know in your first year right I, years ago, I actually got into a, a pretty heated argument with a friend of mine. And his argument was like, basically schools don't need principals. Right. Oh. And I remember him saying this. I said, I said, you're saying this because you don't like your principal. That's why you're saying it right there. And I, I like, I've had principals before and I'm not saying they were bad, but until I had a really good principal, I didn't realize how much of an impact a really great educational administrator is. Do you know what I mean? And I think that to me, like you kind of just assume their job, but th those people like Marty that bring out the best in you bring out the best in the school, you start really seeing the benefit of this. And I, I felt like I had to have an exceptional leader to see the benefit. And, you know, I probably would have argued the same thing with my friend, maybe five yep. years previously. Yep. You know, yeah, they don't. They're just, you know, like they're just people to get on your case and make things rough. But if you have like a really great administrator, it, it's tough to not have that. And I learned so much from, you know, those people. So you've been in education for a while as of I and, you know, looking at all these years, all the things that you do today, you know, you're obviously have a ton of expertise. You're sharing your wisdom with the world. But I guarantee you that there's things that, you know, when you're talking about your first year, there's things you regret, you wish you'd have done differently. So if you can go back to talk to your first year teacher self, what advice would you give? Yeah, gosh, what a great question. And I think there's there's so many. First of all, there's about 40 pieces of advice that I'd probably <laughs> give to myself. But but I think the thing that I, I needed to see was that I was the limiting factor for the kids. And that's something that I wish I, I could go back and change is that the I had this preconceived notion of what kids were capable of. And that came out through my, you know, tasks and things that we did and labs and worksheets and all that stuff. And I look back and just think I really limited in many ways what what kids were, were able to do. And if I could go back in time, if I could say to a first year teacher, the faster you make kids unique thinking observable, the faster you know what to do next. And I just think about all the, the worksheets and sort of rote stuff that we do mm -hmm. today, as opposed to trying to find ways to make kids thinking observable to all of us. That's the biggest regret that I have and the biggest piece of advice that I would give to myself is how do we design tasks, activities, even assessments that give all of our kids a chance to make their thinking observable. So that's the one piece of advice I wish mm -hmm. if I could go back and do that is to make sure that we don't be the limiting factor for kids, that we are the ones that enable them to make their thinking observable. Yeah. And, and the, you know, I appreciate that you, you share that, that term unique because I probably my first year, the whole kind of the whole premise was how do you as a student share my thinking back with me that I get understand that you understand my thinking. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it wasn't like, I didn't, you, you kind of want people just to kind of re, you know, we, we, we kind of say like, Oh, we weren't getting kids to regurgitate, but we kind of were. And that's, <laughs> you know, you want people to think differently and challenge you. And I've had like lots of, I look back on some of the conversations I had with kids and thinking like, Oh yeah, they had a really good point at that time. Like I, I probably didn't address it and they were thinking differently because I was, you know, kind of set in my ways. And we, we had a huge focus, um, you know, in my last school district on critical thinking and looking at information in a different way. And I think this is a, a skill that 
you learn it in school, you'll take it on with adulthood. But if you just kind of learn to kind of check boxes and see this, one of the challenges I, I give to schools, I'm actually curious your thoughts on this. I said, if you're top academic students, okay, and I very distinctly say, I don't say you're smartest kids because we all know this, that some of the smartest kids in school do terrible academically, right? On the things that we measure them in. If you're, your top academic students can get out of school as you know, if they can get out of school ex in an accelerated fashion, would they do that? And if they do, does that, it tells you they see school as a checklist of things to get through, not something that's a valuable experience. I'm curious your thoughts on that statement because I challenge people with that all the time. Well, I think the, the corollary question that goes with that is if, if our classes were optional, it's kind of on the same lines, which ones would kids really take? And it's kind of the same thing that you're saying mm -hmm. is, is if we had the chance, like sometimes when I think about, you know, I taught senior biology and I wondered if kids didn't have to take this, how would I make them want to take this? Right. Why would they? And so I, I think you're right that that in many ways, if if kids just see things as a checkbox, that's, that's on us. Like right now, I think there's this big impetus that in the post COVID era, that kids just aren't engaged anymore. And there's two things I would say to that. First of all, we need to define what we mean by engagement, not only through the lens of the student, but through the lens of the educator and the tasks and activities in their classrooms, number one. But number two, what made us think that kids were engaged before? Mm -hmm. And so I think as you're saying, if people just see school as, as sort of that checkbox, we have to start to look at what are we doing because kids are engaged. And George, you talk about this a lot, but I always use the example of we ski back home and, mm -hmm. and man, we're at Sun Peaks and I'm on the chairlift and it was freezing out. Like, I, I know that we don't, the, the translation from Celsius <laughs> to Fahrenheit right. in, in the I U.S. Still haven't got it. Yeah, yeah. Just let's just say it was so cold, I couldn't believe it. But I noticed this group of kids mm. under the chairlift that were carving out with their snowboards a jump. We went down, did a run, came back up. They're still there, down, up. We're freezing. They weren't getting a mark. There was no mm. one assessing them, but they were totally and completely engaged in an activity because it mattered to them. And so as you're saying, if school is just a checkbox, how do we mm -hmm. turn it into something that truly matters to them? So I think it's a great question that you ask. And I, I always think about if schools were optional, would kids go? And if they, if the answer is no, then we need to take a really good look at what it is that we're doing so that they'd say, yeah, I really want to be there. Hey, everyone listening, I promised you that Kale was smarter than me and you are the first person to use the term corollary <laughs> ever. I don't even know what that means, but I'm sure yeah, I'm lucky people can it's pause it. Google word of the month, a word of the month right <laughs> here. Yeah, so there, I have I, a little I, calendar. I, I told you everybody that was going to happen. So Kale, it has been awesome to reconnect with you and, and learn from you. And I, I, that was such a perfect way to end the podcast. I'm looking forward to connecting with you more. Make sure you check out uh, my further episode with Kale, but thanks for listening. Kale, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. There we go, my guy.